When I think of relational ways of thinking and practicing, I mean, I, I can see that there's two extremes. You can think of, of an individual who enters into relationship, um, or you can think of relational patterns being prior, uh, the priority and the person arising secondarily out of those relationships. So that, I mean, the notion that the mind is a social phenomenon is one perspective, the second, whereas the original one was more the issue of the mind being an epiphenomenon of the brain. And, and say if you look at, say, these intrapsychic theories of, of how we sort of function neurologically, then we enter into relationships, but outside of, you know, out of an individual into the relationship. And I prefer the stance of you know, being grounded totally in the social domain and then secondarily being you know, psychological. Well, I think, I think we're always at risk of drifting back in terms of the self as a separate entity. Um, and I think that's probably a function of our way of living with sensory you know, modalities of listening and hearing and seeing and so forth, that, that we were biased towards that. But I think it's an artifact that um, we're, we're more fundamentally grounded in social relational dynamics. And I think being able to put oneself fully in that domain is not easy. Like, I mean, to sit down with a family and to see the relationships rather than seeing the individual members of the family is not an easy thing to do. But that's what I strive to, to strive to do because I find it's, it's very useful. Because one, one can gain access to mental phenomena when one is dealing with the relational you know, activities that are taking place. Whereas one can't get inside other people's heads, right? Uh, well, let me just maybe add another uh, example. Like, you're familiar with the old um, figure ground gestalt picture of the two faces in the vase? Yeah. Okay, so what I'm interested in sitting down with the family and seeing the shape of the vase. And, and the more you look at the vase, the less you see the faces. It drifts into the background, right? Whereas if you look at the faces, then you don't see the shape of the vase, right? So to me, the relational systemic perspective is to look at the shape of the vase. And that's what I want to do uh, and be grounded there. So what I've done over the years is I've tried to develop some conceptual tools that help me to see the shape of the vase of the relational dynamics and families I work with. Uh, and so I've developed this IPSCOPE framework. But what I'm looking for in the IPSCOPE is to look for the couplings in the interpersonal space. So that if one says working with a family where there's a child that's acting out, right? I'm really curious about what's going on in terms of the interaction between that child and other caregivers or people in the system. So if there's you know, pressuring, you know, inviting acting out, which invites for their pressuring, right? I, I see the coupling of those dynamics. And I want to decouple that coupling and to replace it with a different kind of coupling, you know, which would support more wellness in that relationship. So, I mean, I begin with some kind of a assessment, which, of course, uh, comes out of questions and answers and questions and answers, because there's an ongoing process between me and the family as well, right? And then once I can draw those distinctions, I use them to organize my interview. How do we be more present to the relationship as relational process? Um, I suppose there's a, a number of different ways. Um, one way, way would be to become aware and become aware of our awareness and, and to look at our looking to see what we're seeing and listen to our listening to hear what we're hearing uh, and then use that as a, a way to, as it were, transcend our skin-bounded separateness and see how we're coupled in the relationship with the other. Um, but that requires a fair degree of sophistication in terms of thinking and reflecting and thinking about our thinking and so on, right? I think that's one way. Um, but I suppose there's other ways that are more intuitive, that are more grounded in emotional coupling, um, where there are emotional dynamics that support kind of an intuitive understanding and resonating with the other emotional contagion and those kinds of phenomena. One metaphor that I use a lot, I, I talk about language and how language is among us 
not within us, even though we live and act as if it is within us. Um, but the reason why I speak English is because I was born and raised in a context in which English is spoken. So there was a, a coupling between you know vocal cords and eardrums among the participants in that community. So English then arose in the community, and secondarily, by virtue of the phenomenon of memory, gets internalized, and then we use it for, as a tool for thinking. Right? But language is not in the brain, it's among us. Right? So it's a social phenomenon. Right? If I was born in Russian, Russia, I'd speak Russian. If I was born in China, I'd speak Chinese. So, so language is a social phenomenon, but it does require a biological substrate in order to operate. Right? We need to have a, a brain that's sufficiently plastic that can change as a result of interaction in order for us to get to the level of sophistication in our consensual coordination of eardrums and, and uh, you know, vocal cords and so forth, so that we can enter into these meaningful sounds that we use to coordinate action. Um, so I see that as, as a way of thinking about the mind as being fundamentally a social phenomenon, just like language is, but we still need to have a brain in order to enter into mental phenomena. Uh, because the, the richness between the neurons within the brain are, is about 100,000 times as between our sensory surfaces of you know, vision and hearing and so forth. And it's because of that richness of interconnection in the brain that this becomes possible. If I take that seriously, that, that uh, the mind is first and foremost social and secondarily psychological, then if I then meet an individual, I see that individual as a distillate of a long history of social interaction. Right? That they've interacted recurrently with other people, and those interactions have been taken in and constituted them as a particular individual. So I would see personality, basically, as a phenomenon that's secondary to um, a long you know, uh, uh, sort of concatenation of drifting in certain patterns of interaction that become stabilized by virtue of the phenomenon of memory. Right? Now, if, if that's valid, then it should be possible for me, potentially, to access that memory and to bring into the relationship between myself and the client, you know, those previously internalized phenomena. And that's what I do when I do this internalized other interviewing, right? So I would say, ask that I could speak to your mother, right? So you've got your mother, she's part of you and so forth. So I could ask you, what's your mother's name? And then, then use her name to speak to you as if you were your mother. So what I do then is I, I bring out your mother as part of you. And then once I bring that out, I can look at different aspects of that relationship and then deconstruct what I see as problematic patterns, and then privilege, you know, wellness patterns instead. Right? And and I've done this work where I've actually gone back a generation, you know, to in one case I was interviewing a psychologist who volunteered to be interviewed in a workshop, and he wanted me to interview his internalized father because his father was very critical of his choice of profession because he was a farmer and believed in, you know, doing work with your hands, and he couldn't fathom his son getting paid to sit and talk to people, right? And so um, when I in start speaking to his internalized father, you know, and, and the father then answered, and he, sure enough, he came out with all kinds of very negative, you know, disappointing statements about his son and so forth. And I was a bit stumped. I was trying to ask reflexive questions to open space for change. And eventually I thought of asking the internalized father who in his life had been most positive and affirming for him. And he mentioned well, his mother. So I said, okay, can I talk to your mother for a bit? Okay, now I'm speaking to the internalized mother of the internalized father, which is the psychologist's grandmother, but it, I wasn't speaking to her as a grandmother. I was speaking to her as the internalized mother of the internalized father. And I asked a series of questions to the internalized mother of the internalized father, and sure enough, she was able to speak of how proud she was of her son and how capable he was with his hands to do this and that and so forth, and ask a series of questions to bring forth the positive emotioning of the respect and appreciation. And then I thanked her and said goodbye to her. And then I resumed talking to the internalized father and asked him questions about his son and then he could answer positively. So it's like I had to go back a generation to retrieve some positive emotioning and then bring it into the relationship between this psychologist and his father. But I was dealing with his internalized community right? and, and entering into you know, a, a history that was a distillate of many, many years of, of interaction. Okay, I, I distinguish emotion from emotioning.
because I see emotioning as a relational process. Like the coupling between, say, anger and fear, which is a very common relational dynamic, right? I mean, you get coupling between other emotions too, of course. Um, but if you look at the coupling, then you're more grounded in the interpersonal space, which is where I want to be, be working most of the time. Whereas emotion, I see as a, a sort of a total body disposition for a particular category of action, like anger is an emotion oriented towards attack, right? And you can attack physically, or you're going to attack by, you know, assaulting somebody, I mean, uh, challenging them in your argumentation or whatever, right? Whereas emotion of fear is, just, you know, trying to escape. You can run away or change the subject or whatever. Emotion of love is to open space for the existence of the other. So, so there's a bodily disposition for certain types of actions, but that's a skin-bounded separate phenomenon. Emotioning refers to the coupling of emotional dynamics. And that, to me, is, is a really good place to be grounded. Like one of the, the emotions that arise very, very quickly between human beings is mutual respect, you know, or, or loving, if you like. Right? And this happens so fast. I mean, the, when you meet somebody, says hi. Oh, hi, back, right? Or thank you. You're welcome, right? Those are, those are couplings in the impersonal domain that are supported by the emotion of you know, mutual caring, respect, love, and so forth. But there's a coupling of acknowledgments that's so fast. And we live in those dynamics, but we don't realize it. That we're, we're co-constructing, as it were, wellness in our relationships through, through those dynamics. I think it's outside of our conscious awareness. Because we, we don't pay attention to the, the interpersonal process. We pay attention to either our own you know, thoughts or whatever, or what we think is going on in the other person, right? And so we get stuck in that individualism. So it's not easy at all. It takes a lot of discipline. And I think it's, it's hard to stay there. Like you, you can work yourself up to that in terms of reflecting and reflecting upon your reflections, but they can slip away so quickly. To me, it's, it's a very, it, it's, it's, a, it's a level of recursioning if, if you understand what that word means in terms of recursion is the application of an operation to the results of that operation. So you're always um, working on the results of, of a particular operation. And language is seen to be a recursive process, at least, at least in Maturana's theory of knowledge. So um, that kind of complexity of, of always looking at you know, the consequences of the consequences and so forth. It's not easy, and it takes a fair bit of well reflection and humility to to try to um, bring forth what makes sense in a particular moment, rather than remaining grounded in one's desires or intentions. There is a coupling that's going on all the time in terms of um, the meanings of the 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 words we use. Um, like I, one of the distinctions I like and I use in my clinical work is, is Michael White's landscape of action, landscape of meaning, right? Um, and landscape of action is quite straightforward in terms of describing particular events and actors who are engaged in those events. But then to go to the landscape of meaning, where one tries to explain or make sense of what happens in the landscape of action, that's where we get stuck in individualism, right? And, and we need to then look at our looking to see what we're seeing and distinguish our distinctions up there in terms of what meaning we've attributed to what's going on here. So if someone is, as we're crying, we can distinguish that as whining or as weeping. And of course, those distinctions change the interpersonal dynamic significantly, right? Because if someone's whining, of course, we want to stop them from whining. But if they're weeping, we want to be compassionate and comfort them. So there's politics involved with all the words we use. You know, and and that, that politics is a f oh, it's a grounded entirely in the social domain. Well, politics has to do with the organization um, of the relationships between differences that are distinguished. I mean, you, could, you can juxtapose differences. There's A and there's B. Or you could align them A and B, where you, you know, imply a preference of A over B, right? And so we implicitly do that all the time. And we sometimes, and there's advantages and disadvantages for both. Um, but I think that as soon as we privilege A over B, 
we create a, a, a relational dynamic. Um, but we can be aware of that and how that's unfolding with respect to whether it's oppressive uh, or whether it's enabling of, say, the B position. We can, like, the A position could be to enable B to be heard, right? That as we as human beings have entered into language and become increasingly sophisticated in the use of language and being able to perform more and more things through the use of language, that we found that to be such a valuable tool that we've extended it and um, used language to distinguish selves in ways that have led to a sense of separateness. You know, and then, of course, the Descartes statement, you know, I think, therefore, I am, right? That's, I mean, I, I, I do accept the Maturana's position that you know, teaching is not possible, but it's possible to create conditions for learning, right? Uh, but we can act as if teaching is possible. <laughs> so that's why I lecture still, <laughs> because we're sufficiently coupled in language that we can sometimes, you know, help the other come to similar distinctions more quickly, but they're never identical, I don't think. In fact, I, I'm really quite grounded in Maturana's work. I can I see myself as a, a um, bring forthist more than a social constructionist, because I see social constructionism as um, grounded in groundlessness, and that to me is not sufficiently satisfying. So I prefer being grounded in biology, and, and that's why Maturana's theory appeals to me more um, more than social constructionism. But I, I, I see compatibilities. Um, and in Maturana's theory, the notion of coupling is, is foundational in terms of, of how living systems couple with the niche in which they're living. They, they have to be coupled such that they can retain their organization of, of living, you know, the autopoiesis, the, the term that Maturana coined to describe that. So, that's where that notion comes from, and I just apply it then into the you know, relational therapy domain, which I find is very useful. And I see the coupling as uh, basically mutual invitations. That they're, they're not um, sort of necessary connections, they're not functional connections, they're not linear connections, they're mutual invitations. So, and what's so important about that description, from my point of view, is that implicitly an invitation is something you can decline. I mean, if someone invites you into a certain kind of coupling, you can, you know, basically say no and, and issue a different invitation. Well, I don't, let's um, enter into mutual respect. How's that? Instead of, <laughs> you know, blaming criticism and uh, defensiveness or whatever. It's really hard, I think, for people to... Uh, be aware of the relational dynamic that they're part of. Because they, they need to sort of partly step out of it in order to see it. Uh, and then when you're able to do that, then you can more easily issue a different invitation for a different pattern. Right. Externalizing is a very useful practice. And if people can language the coupling in such a way that they can then externalize it from both of them, you know, and look at whether they want to persist in it or not is useful. Like if people get into a recurrent pattern of, say, criticism and defensiveness and so forth, and I ask them, well, you know, do you have a name for that? Well, haggling. Okay. So when haggling takes over your relationship, what's it like for you? Right? So then you've distinguished this externalized entity of haggling, which is a phenomenon in the interpersonal space, and invite them to reflect on the consequences of allowing themselves to participate or be drawn into that invitational pattern. And so then I you know, ask, well, what percentage of your relationship is dominated by haggling, right? And, and what would you prefer instead? Yeah, so if they're able to name, name the coupling, you know, that, that interpersonal phenomenon, that relational phenomenon, that then objectifies it in a way that makes it possible for them to interact with it. Right? And that open space for you know, the possibility of choice to engage in a different kind of pattern instead. I guess you're familiar with um, Stephen Madigan's work, are you? And yes, with yeah. writing a letter to the relationship and that. That's a really useful idea. Yeah. Well, one of the big differences I see between social constructionism and bring forthism is that um, bring forthism offers an explanation for how the social actors arise so that they can enter into interactions to 
generate constructs. But social constructionism takes that as a given, you know, that, that we find ourselves interacting socially. And then, you know, on the basis of that given, that we develop constructs together. Okay? And I agree with that, but how do you, the actors get there to start with? And this is where, you know, the biology in Maturana offers an explanation, you know, theory of evolution and evolving living systems to the point that these plastic nervous systems evolve that make it possible to interact recurrently so that through the phenomenon of memory, those patterns are taken in to be amplified then to be so rich that we can enter into language and extend our possibilities. Well, the phenomenon of identity itself is a social phenomenon, it's not a biological phenomenon. It requires biology to arise, um, but identity arises through language and relational dynamics. I mean, we come to know who we are through language, basically. Um, and so, um, once we are in language and we use language, to distinguish ourselves as entities in relation to others, then that begins the process of, as it were, decoupling somewhat, as it were, from the relational process because we're into our own thinking then, right? And we get seduced then into believing that we are separate individuals. Um, and I don't think it's... And, and of course, if we, if we remain disconnected, then we are uh, at risk for a conservative drift in our thinking that gets narrower and narrower and narrower. Uh, we need to continue to be in social relationships to uh, be creative, to generate new distinctions. We need to be challenged and so forth. We can't do that entirely as separate selves. Um, and a lot of people who write, I guess, they, they talk about isolating themselves on the beach in a little cabin to write and so forth. But really they're interacting, you know, or they're, if they're reading somebody, you know, they're interacting with the author, right? There's a social process going on there, right? Um, so we have this um, experience of being so separate when we're not. Um, from my point of view, consciousness itself is a social phenomenon. Even though, like, I think of my consciousness as in my head, maybe um, two inches behind my eyes and maybe one inch above, because like, it's my center of consciousness. But I think that's an artifact. Uh, that's just a result of a, a long history of interaction and languaging and, you know, making sense of relationships and so forth and coming into awareness. And this, the distinctions of self place you in a domain which makes it possible for you to have new interactions. Like when you, you know, have the identity of student, right? Yeah, yeah. And that justifies you, you know, going to university yeah, and, yeah. and not earning money but spending it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm a therapist sometimes, I'm a teacher sometimes, I'm a husband sometimes, I'm a father sometimes. I get many, many, many identities. And I'm a friend, this kind of friend, that kind of friend, it's what many ways of being a friend, I mean, and any particular identity is very context dependent in terms of what unique interactions take place in a, a particular situation. And, and I use this whole idea of, of multiple identities of self in my work. Like if I you know, encounter someone with so-called multiple personality disorder, right? <laughs> I normalize it in such a way that they can come out of that more easily than because sometimes people inadvertently reinforce you know those separate identities you know, by getting too curious about them and then co-constructing greater you know complexity in those multiple identities. The idea that we do have a separate self as if we are separate individuals, I think that's an illusion. It's a very seductive one. And, and maybe there's a part of that that is necessary for, for survival, too, in terms of, given the degree of complexity of our communities, that we need to, as it were, enter into self-care and have a self to care for. And so it's not all bad. It's not all bad.
How do you play with uncertainty of co-creation, even as you talk about patterns? Actually, what comes to mind is not how I do it, but how a colleague does it. <laughs> um, I have a colleague that works in our program part-time, and she supervises as well. And one of the, the gifts that she has is to use metaphor in such a way that she generates confusion, but just sufficient confusion for people to be curious and to let go of those certainties. And that, to me, is a gift, is a talent. Being able to, and I, I think we do that as therapists quite a bit when we use their language, the family's language, but we problematize it somehow and we kind of twist it. And that, I think, liberates people from overly certain, you know, holding of certain meanings and so forth, which is, I think, very useful for opening space for change. And I think that it's partly that that was part of the brilliance of the Milan team's contribution of paradoxes. Because when they introduced paradoxes, they introduced confusion. And if you introduce confusion around firmly held ideas, you loosen things up, other ideas can come up. Right? So I, I think introducing confusion in a good way is, 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 a, is a useful thing to do. To, to uh, draw out contradictions, inconsistencies, and so forth. Once I've introduced some confusion, I would try to open space for what I see as a, a possibility that could be constructive. So I'd want to um, bias the direction of drift in the conversation to what I imagine could be constructive for them and their wellness and healing, um, realizing that I don't know for sure, but then listening to their you know, feedback all the time and to be willing to change my, my position depending on what they say or do. Would that be different if you were with your wife or your students or...? Um, probably, because most of the time I don't work to that level of awareness. <laughs> I let myself drift in the flow of, of being and living. And most of the time I, I live in an objective world and act as if there really is a red light there that I have to stop. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm in a different space when I'm working therapeutically than when I'm living mm -hmm. my own life. Mm -hmm. I mean, I use my therapeutic awareness sometimes in my living, mm -hmm. but it's, it's possible to be therapeutic without being a therapist. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I do believe that. Yeah. Well, I guess my closing thought is that I'm not sure that I know what I know. Um, that, I mean... Coming to realize that you don't know is useful, right? But then if we don't know that we don't know, then maybe we do know. And that's where I have to come to, because I need to act sometimes. But I need to always be prepared to question whether I know or not.